So welcome back everyone for another edition of Five Minutes with K-12 Online Learning and today the with is Dr. Mary Rice. Um, before I get to Mary, I just want to mention that today is Green Shirt Day and if you're not familiar with what Green Shirt Day is or the Logan Boulay effect, um, in the comments below or in the text below, I'll have links to both of those things that you can check out. So welcome Mary. Um, can we get started by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm an assistant professor of literacy at the University of New Mexico. In my research on online learning, I've worked with many students, teachers, and administrators, as well as parents, supporting children who are learning with online materials. So previously, I was a graduate student and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Kansas in the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. And even before that, I was an English language arts uh, reading and ESL teacher for 10 years. Very good. And I know most of your work has focused upon um, either online learning in special education or online learning and language learning, specific language, language learning. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a bunch of teachers out there now that are being thrown into this, although depending on where they're living, some may be just getting started, some may still be um, planning, some may be starting their second or third week with this, but they're all still scrambling at this point. Um, is there any advice that you would give to them based upon the things you've picked up over the years? Yeah, so uh, first about students with disabilities. I, um, in the United States, they're guaranteed a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment under a legislation called IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. And the purpose of that act is to give them access to general education. But in times of uh, like this in times of COVID-19, so determining whether a school, whether school should be held at all and in what capacity and what FAPE and LRE mean is sort of new territory. So right now there's widespread agreement that things like minutes listed on the IEP for the disability plan for how long students should receive services um, are in flux. And I even got a, saw a letter yesterday from a school district saying, uh, we'll serve your child to the best of our ability, but um, right now we're not sure what we're going to be able to provide. And so I think that it's to school's advantage to do provide some services to the best of their ability because regardless of what happens, you know, hopefully over the long term outcomes, we'll all go back to school or some students may even stay in the fully online context and we want to make sure that they have access to general education and can live independently and participate in communities. And so for educators who are serving students with disabilities or serving diverse students in these uncertain conditions, I have about six recommendations. So first, students with disabilities who are doing remote learning or learning with online materials, um, there needs to be some assurance they've got access to the devices and the internet. So these students are among the most likely not to have them. So second, consider accessibility when choosing learning materials. There are lots of neat sites out there right now for building lessons and videos, but they're not all that accessible. So questions like, do parents or students have to set up an account? So are the sites complex to navigate? Do they have captions? Do they require a lot of internet bandwidth to load? and then try not to recommend or offer those inaccessible materials. So number three, you gotta check the complexity of the text and the assigned reading. Much online text is conceptually dense and hyperlinked, which creates issues for students with challenges in decoding and processing. So giving students an audio version of the text doesn't automatically resolve access concerns. So the kind of support that helps includes prompts that activate their background knowledge, explicit vocabulary teaching, assistance in setting the purpose for reading, conceptual maps and organizers and things like that. And also students with many types of disabilities do very well when taught using mnemonics and stories with embedded concepts. So you wanna talk about the planets. So tell the story, tell a story about the planets. Um, be careful with writing too. So even outside online learning, writing is assigned more than it's taught. So take the journal about your life assignment that's really common right now. So some students might be able to sit right down and do a journal, but students with functional difficulties are going to have trouble getting ideas, planning, 
drafting and seeing why journaling is useful and important. Instead, so provide opportunities to gather and develop ideas, provide models and examples for how to turn ideas into sentences and paragraphs, and brainstorm with them about who's going to read the writing now and in the future. So five is set expectations for peer interactions and reinforce them. So tell students what to do during video conferences to participate. Provide a guide and a tutorial for using the tools. Give timely feedback to them in a, as groups and individually about participation. And also I think it's important to try not to block tools permanently if you can avoid it, like chat. So instead set some expectations, provide some guidance, give feedback and help them learn to use chat. And finally, communicate with parents. So with students with disabilities, tell them their rights. Tell them what the school's responsibilities are right now in your state or district and offer strategies for instruction engagement and then listen to them and respond. Okay, thank you. Um, you finished up with parents there. Um, you know, along the same vein, you've got a bunch of parents now that are thrown into this environment for the first time. Is there anything that you would suggest for them um, as they're interacting with their teachers and the, the schools? Yes. Um, well, first, not all children right now are being guided by parents. And I actually include those others, which might be grandparents or neighbors or friends in my definition of family as I'm going to talk about it. So, and I think families will be more successful if instead of trying to replicate school, they repurpose life to include a directed learning that alternates between online educational experiences and offline ones. So you have to think about what norms and routines and traditions for getting the work of the family done and then use those. And by the same token, if you have traditions or patterns that are unhealthy or not optimal, then you can plan for new ones. So, and I have some ideas here that are pretty specific. So questions like, when does the family like to work? So some are early bird families, some are more active in the afternoon, other families are night owls, and so you can use those patterns. So how does the family divide domestic labor, like chores, and then the labor of educating now? So you can draw on those. So if they happen to mostly fall on one member, which a lot of fully online learning falls on the mother, so make adjustments until more people are participating. So how can patterns of sibling interaction be leveraged? So which siblings will help each other? Which ones should be separated? How are technological devices normally regulated for time and shared? And then also how offline time can be used for authentic experiences. So you could talk about germs and how they're spread. You could do things like sewing, which develops coordination and precision and attention and stamina, um, even some math skills, cooking, right? It helps you think about chemistry and math, even if you don't know all the technical terms. Sometimes families can construct parts of the budget together, even talk about family history and heritage, practice languages other than English, if they're part of, especially if they're part of family identity. Oral language proficiency in any language is an important factor and predictor in literacy skills. And the way you get it, you talk with kids about a variety of topics. So, and that said, here are some other strategies for supporting children's focus for short periods. So one, use a timer to help children pace. They also might want to beat it for some tasks. You can think really creatively about rewards. So stars on a chart or whiteboard or colored slips of paper. It doesn't always have to be food or something elaborate. So find a fidget device or a sensory experience, something to spin or run your fingers on, a rubber band to snap or a towel. So change up the activity. So remember children don't have super long attention spans for sort of worksheets and clerical work. So you have to think about how to use your minutes for that stuff in ways it's really important. Celebrate or share your learning. You know, you can clap, dance or call grandma. And then set some boundaries for adult work and emotional health, because a lot of us are still working too. <laughs> so you, you have to talk about the family schedule and planning and be really firm about your time. And then also one thing I learned as a teacher about how, is about how important it is to thank the children right, for their patience and for their attention and things like that. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Mary. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, today with Dr. Mary Rice.